So basically, we are here to discuss about the histology of bone today. And uh, yes, we already had a detailed discussion from our Dr. Sanjit sir regarding the anatomy of bone. So today we'll be seeing what exactly you can uh, understand about the microscopic view of bone. So before I move into the details of what you can see under the microscope, I would just like to take a moment to recap what we learned from Dr. Sanjit sir. So yes, uh, bone, it's a connective tissue. To be more precise, it is a specialized connective tissue, right? It's a very important uh, specialized form of a connective tissue. Now, what is this speciality all about? It's a very rigid form of a connective tissue, which is going to give maximum support, strength and helps in weight bearing and all those things. So that is why the extracellular matrix, which we uh, discussed before, it's very, you know, very um, sophisticated in that manner where there are a lot of inorganic salts embedded in the um, ground substance, which contains all this proteoglycans, glycosaminoglycans, collagen fibers and all those things. So we had an idea about what the whole uh, bone is all about. Now, apart from that, I have also kept a small image of a bone uh, to just do a recap. Basically, the important three parts, the epiphyses, metaphyses, diaphyses, Apart from that, the articular cartilage, and you can see that the outer covering, this, this, the outer part of the bone, which is a very thick and, you know, rigid part that is basically called as the compact bone. And it is covered by the outer membrane, which is called as the periosteum. And also there is an inner, you know, a mid middle cavity for the bone, which is called as the medullary cavity. And, you know, there are bone marrow in the bone. And in the ends, it's usually the red marrow. And there you can see the spongy bone as well. And in the middle, in the medullary cavity is where you get yellow bone marrow. This is an adult bone to be, uh, you know, starting off with. And also uh, the endosteum, which is actually the covering or the, you know, lining the medullary cavity. So we have uh, done a quick recap of what it is all about. And we are moving forward with the next particular thing. So uh, under the microscope, what exactly we see? Uh, in case of the bone, when you cut a section of the bone and you view it under the microscope, there are a few things which you will be seeing. The first one is the bone membrane, the membrane of the bone. Then there will be certain cells that you can see. Okay, The cells which you are actually talking about is the bone cells. We'll discuss in detail about each one of it. Don't take attention right now. Just remember these things. The first one is the bone membrane. The second one are the cells corresponding to that particular specimen. And third thing is the ground substance or the extracellular matrix, which we were talking about. So we have uh, organic matrix as well as inorganic matrix. And uh, this too is what we will be uh, discussing about and what we will be seeing under the microscope in detail. So to start off with, we have bone membrane. Now coming to the bone membrane, if you see, I have written a word there, periosteum. We all have we are all familiar with this term, right? The periosteum is the outer covering of the bone. We very well know that, okay? So now what exactly are we supposed to know more about this particular layer? Imagine um, this periosteum is like a paper, okay? And if you, uh, or maybe like you can, you can just take the example of your palm. You can just uh, consider your palm yourself as a periosteum of your hand as your periosteum. And there is an inner surface, right? The, the white surface. That is the inner layer of your palm as well as the outer layer is the outer layer of the periosteum. So you have an inner layer as well as the outer layer for the periosteum. Why I am telling you this is because the functions of the periosteum is closely related to these layers. So if you can see the picture there, if you can see the picture there, there is a outer layer which has a lot of you know thin fibrous bands you can see fibrous bands there in this layer you can see right yes so basically since it is a lot of fibrous bands there what is it nothing but a fibrous membrane the outer membrane or the outer layer of the periosteum is nothing but a fibrous membrane now coming to the inner you can see small greenish things there these greenish ones these greenish ones are nothing but cells okay they are cells which are going to be helping in the formation of new bone okay so the next layer basically consists of cells and these cells are going to help in the formation of new bones and that is why the next layer or the inner layer is called as cellular layer so two layers 
which is the fibrous outside and the cellular inside. Now, another important point here is that these periosteum membrane, the, the periosteum as a whole, is richly supplied with blood vessels. To be precise, the periosteal vessels. Okay, so remember these three points. It is an external membrane and it is going to help you, um, you know, um, cover the entire surface of the bone. Now, when I say the entire surface of the bone, remember there is an area in the bone which is devoid or which where there is no periosteum. Now, which is that area? It is nothing but the articular cartilage. Where there is the articular cartilage, it is not covered by periosteum in a bone. Remember that important point, okay? Now, three points which I was talking is, it's an external membrane, uh, covering the surface of the bone, excluding the articular cartilage, the two layers, the outer fibrous and the inner cellular. And the third point is that it is very rich in blood supply. Now, with these three points, we will come out with the functions of periosteum. So, I told you it's an external membrane, right? So, what is the purpose of the bone generally? One important function of the bone is that uh, there is a lot of tissues that gets attached to the bony surface, right? The muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, all these fibers, they are getting attached to the bony surface. Now, when this uh, tissues are getting attached, they should get attached to a particular part or a particular, um, you know, layer of the bone. Now, which is that layer? That layer is nothing but the periosteum. So, the external membrane, the first point was the external membrane, right? So, it is the medium through which these muscles, tendons, ligaments get attached. Now, I have mentioned a point there called a Sharpie's fibers. Now, the Sharpie's fibers is nothing but um, in a case, suppose there is a tendon which needs to be very strongly attached to the bone. Okay, there is no chance that there can be a, you know, a little um, less of a strength or less of a tightness in that uh, particular tendon attachment. So, in that case, what happens is this, uh, these fibers, this uh, periosteal fibrous uh, layer, the periosteal layer as such, they will just differentiate and form or deeper into the bony surface. They'll just move inside. You can see tiny, you know, extensions coming inside. So they are basically fibers of the periosteum itself, but they do enter deeply into the bone so that the attachment of that particular tendon is very strong with that of the bone. Okay, so they are an important term there that is Sharpie's fibers. They are just, you know, um, outgrowths or extensions of this periosteal membrane deep in, into the bone so that the attachment of that particular tendon or ligament is very strong with that of the bone. So that is the first important function. The next one is that, of course, they are very rich in blood supply. I told you that. So who will be providing the nutritive function? Again, periosteum has that function also because the nutrition can be very well achieved with the help of a very rich blood supply. So nutritive function is the second important thing. One third of the you know outer covering of the periosteum, it's, it's supplied by the periosteal layer itself. Now, coming to the formation of the bone. Now, remember the third point which I mentioned was the two layers, right? The outer layer and an inner layer. In the inner layer, I clearly mentioned that there is a cellular layer with a lot of cells which helps in formation of new bone. So, these cells, of course, will form new bone whenever there is an event like a fracture of a bone has happened and this bone has to be grown again. So, in that particular point, the formation of bone happens with the help of these cells which is present in the cellular layer. Now, the last one is a limiting membrane. Now, what happens uh, when periosteum serves as a limiting membrane is these cells which are helping in, you know, growing new bone can actually uh, come out of the periosteum at times. Okay, if the periosteum is not intact, it can come out of the periosteal lining and it can cause small protrusions, small bony protrusions in the bony surface. And what happens is this bony masses can go and compress the veins, uh, arteries, nerves and cause problems to the patient. So it always helps us forming a limiting membrane, which will prevent the bony tissue from spilling out into the neighboring cells. So these are the important ones about periosteum. Nothing to worry, external membrane, two layers, outer inner, rich blood supply, nutritive function, formation of new bone, limitive, limiting membrane and finally attachment of these tissues. Now coming to the uh, next part, which is what we see under the microscope is the cells. So different kinds of cells are there. To be naming them, we have osteoprogenitor cells, 
osteoblast cells, osteocyte cells, and osteoclast cells. So four names, osteoprogenitor, osteoblast, osteocytes, and osteoclast. Now, moving into the each one, uh, we already had an idea about all these cells in the previous session, but just a quick recap so that you understand and you will able to, uh, you'll be able to understand how the histology is studied based on these types of cells. The first one is the osteoprogenitor cells. So osteoprogenitor cells, the word itself says, so genitor, osteoprogenitor, something which is going to help in formation of a bone, but it is not the exact thing. It is just a uh, 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 an initial uh, cell or the first cell which helps in the formation of a bone. So nothing, but it, it is a stem cell. Basically, it is a stem cell that helps in the formation of new bones. So this is originated from the mesenchymal stem cell. So you can say it's a mesenchymal originated stem cell, which is helping in formation of new bones. So this osteoprogenitor cells, you can see here. So this is a mesenchymal stem cell which will proliferate into formation of an osteogen osteoprogenitor cells. And this cells will again proliferate into other types of cells, which we already mentioned, like osteoblast, osteocytes and all. And so that final osteocyte is formed, which is the mature cell. Okay, So it proliferates into a bone forming cells. That is about the osteoprogenitor cells. Now, coming into the next one, which is osteoblast cells. Now, what is this osteoblast cells? The word says osteoblast. So there is a letter B. How I used to remember when I was in, you know, first year is that osteoblast. B letter is there. So the cells which help in giving birth to bones. So new bone is formed with the help of blast cells. Okay, B, birth, B stands for birth. Okay, so osteoblast helps in forming new cells. So there are a lot of, um, uh, you know, osteo a lot of shapes in which these osteoblast cells are usually seen. You can see there are triangular shaped cells, there are oval shapes, there are cuboidal cells. There are different types of cell shapes are there for these osteoblast cells. And if you see these cells, there are they are separated by adjacent gaps. You can see good gaps are present between these cells. They are not very you know very nicely packed like how you see in an epithelium cell and all. Okay, there are like little gaps are present in between each adjacent cells. Now, if you see the nucleus, you see the nucleus here, right? They are also kind of ovoid in shape and euchromatic. What is this euchromatic? Euchromatic is nothing, but it is the same color as that of the cytoplasm. It's almost similar in color. They have taken up the blue stain. Now, that is why the cytoplasm has become basophilic. Now, why is it that they take up the blue stain or it's the basophilic cytoplasm? This is because they have a very well-developed or an abundant rough endoplasmic reticulum. They have abundant rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus. Now, what is the significance here? Why do they have a very abundant rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus? This is because, as I told you, osteoblasts are the birth-giving cells. They form new cells. So they are actively into synthetic function, right? They actively synthesize the new bones. So since they are actively into synthetic function, they have to have these kind of uh, organelles, cell organelles, which are like ready to, you know, meet up all the synthetic activity. So they are abundant, rough endoplasmic reticulum and even the Golgi complex is a major reason why they end up having a basophilic cytoplasm or it's the blue stain that is predominant there. Now, Coming to the function, their main function is to make sure that they lay down a good organic matrix of the bone. As I told you, they have extracellular matrix. The bone have an extracellular matrix and it has organic and inorganic component. The organic component of the matrix laying down, that is a one important function of these osteoblast cells. Apart from that, they help also in the mineralization of the bone. They also help in the addition of minerals to the matrix of the bone. So that is about the second variety osteoblast. So we started off with osteoprogenitor cells, nothing but the stem cells, which start off giving the uh, new bones, I mean the, the precursor cells. Then coming to the osteoblast, which is the bone forming cells, we told about the cytoplasm, nucleus, the Golgi apparatus, rough endoplasmic reticulum and all those things and helps in the laying down of the organic matrix of the bone. So that is the second variety. Now coming to the important one, which is the osteocyte. Osteocyte is nothing, 
but the mature bone cell. If, if a bone cell has mature, you can call it osteocyte. Now, how do you identify if it's a mature or not? The, the features that you can see in an osteocyte is that they usually take up the pink stain. It's usually the eosinophilic cytoplasm and they're very small cells. See, see if you can see here, they're very tiny cells when compared to the osteoblast or the osteoclast. Okay, they're very small cells. And you can see even if the cells are small, you can see a sharp dot in all these cells, correct? All these cells have a very sharp and clear dot. Now, what is it? They have a very prominent nucleus. The nucleus is very prominent in their cell. Now, the next thing is an important thing, which is called a cytoplasmic processes. So, in these osteocytes, the cytoplasm just extends out. They show outward invaginations. Like what happens is the cells get into projections, outside projections. And these projections are nothing but cytoplasmic processes. And they have an important role in um, their function and all those things, which we will be discussing eventually. Just understand now, their cytoplasm is not just like a rounded, bordered, you know, clear one. They'll have small projections outside coming out of it. And that is called a cytoplasmic processes. Now, what is the function? It forms the major bone tissue of the, uh, the, the whole um, bone as such. Now, we discussed osteoprogenitor, osteoblast, osteocyte, and finally, the osteoclast. Osteoclast is nothing but the bone removing cells. Now, I told you B stood for birth, giving birth to new bone cells. So, here C, osteoclast is C. C for cut, cut off the bone, cutting off and removing the bone. So that is what osteoclast is doing. They just remove the bones. Now, basically how it happens is if you see the bone tissue, you can see there are small pits. There are small areas, small pit-like areas like this, where these osteoclast cells are seen in abundance. And this is the area where usually bone removing activity or osteoclastic activity usually happen and that area is called nothing but the resorption base or the lacunae of horseship of, of, okay so resorption base nothing but they are small pits seen in the surface in the surface of the lamellae where osteoclastic cells are highly predominant okay now if you see this cell it's such a huge cell right see it's, it's a very large cell and you can see so many nuclei inside one, two, three, multiple nuclei. So if you see the size, they're usually varying from 20 to 100 uh, micrometer in diameter. And there are a lot of nuclei also, like average up to 20 or more than that nuclei also can be seen is what um, we uh, have to learn in according to the literature. So here you can see multiple nuclei as in, and it's a very large cell compared to all the cells what we have already seen. Now, apart from that, their mitochondria, new lysosomes are all numerous in number. And another important property of this cell is that they have a ruffled border. Now, what is this ruffled border? Let me take you guys back to this particular slide. If you take this slide, see this slide here, there is a very irregular bordered cell. See, see this osteoclast, one border is very irregular. It's very, you know, uh, it's as if it's just torn of rashly, right? Yeah, that irregular border of the cell is one important property of osteoclast, which is called as a ruffled border, okay? It's called as a ruffled border. Uh, function is nothing but the resorption or the destruction of bone. So there are a lot, of, you may have a doubt, how come they get destroyed or how come the bone is actually one cell itself is coming and killing it? It's actually a part of the normal uh, process because if you do not let it resorb or destroy, uh, you know, uncontrolled proliferation of bones occur. So it, it can go to other disease conditions. So it's important that we limit the, the production or the new formation of a bone. And that is why osteoclast is there. And osteoclast, just like that, do and go and just destroy. No, there are a lot of, you know, uh, physiological processes happening. There are a lot of hormones which come into play, a lot of chemicals which come into play. Even osteoblast itself is one of the, uh, agent which will control the um, you know proliferation of bones so you will learn all those things very detailed in the physiology don't worry of all those things but understand osteoclast is the cell which is helping in keeping the control of the bone growth or helping in the destruction of bone now how does the bone get destroyed nothing but a demineralization the minerals get removed and even the matrix are getting destroyed that is how the resorption or destruction of the bone occur so we had a discussion of bone membrane, the four different kinds of cells and coming to the next one which is ground substance.
ground ground substance it's nothing but it's actually a an extracellular matrix which we are talking about now in bones in this extracellular matrix we have two components one is the organic component and one is the inorganic component now coming to the organic component what we have there is nothing but all these things glycosaminoglycans proteoglycans water you have phospholipids you have chondroitin sulfate these are all different kinds of um, you know um, biological uh, substances which are present in the matrix they are organic in nature with which has a lot of proteins and other things which will help in maintain the proper durability or proper uh, you know strength of the bone it is very important that you understand each uh, and every uh, things which, which form a part of it and why it is actually there okay so organic is uh, glycosaminoglycans proteoglycans water you have uh, chondroitin sulfate phospholipids phosphoproteins and all these things apart from that you also have something called as collagen fibers okay now these collagen fibers basically it's the type 1 to be precise type 1 collagen fibers are also present in the ground substance and these are remember these collagen fibers if you see here see these are the collagen fibers they are usually lying parallel to each other okay and they are usually formed in multiple layers it's like one after the other there are so many layers of collagen fibers so inner layer all of the collagen fibers will be parallel to each other and there will be multiple layers of collagen fibers one after the other so all these things together okay the organic component of the uh, extracellular matrix of bone is what we call by the name osteoid remember the term osteoid it is nothing but the organic component it's nothing but the ground substance or the matrix without the inorganic component that is the minerals or the mineral salts now i have added two names here osteonectin and osteocalcin two names osteonectin and osteocalcin it is nothing but they are the proteoglycan specific proteoglycan which is going to help uh, in the maintaining the ground substance in the uh, of the bone so specific to the bone if there is a question coming what are the proteoglycans with specific to the um, extracellular matrix in bone remember these two words it's just a purpose of you know um, understanding and recalling osteonectin and osteocalcin so coming to the inorganic component so organic component we discussed inorganic we know what it is what bones contain we know we always in irrespective of all, all these cells and all this of a periosteum we always tend to say calcium what is there in bone calcium phosphorus this is what we always say that is exactly what we want here also the inorganic component is basically the calcium and phosphorus mainly apart from that we have magnesium carbonate hydroxyl chloride citrate sodium potassium fluoride and a lot of things like that but remember three important things from this the first one calcium second one phosphorus and the third one hydroxyl these three groups these three ions they form together and they they, they you know they form a compound called as hydroxyapatite now what is the importance of this hydroxyapatite is when they form this hydroxyapatite we can see them as needle shaped crystals okay it can be seen as needle shaped crystals and this needle shaped crystals will be like present in the matrix see there are collagen fibers here right this needle shaped crystals will be parallel to these collagen fibers and that is how we maintain that strength durability and all those things of the bone it is very important that we identify the importance of it so for example if i can ask you a uh, simple question um there is a bone okay we take a femur and we uh, <clears throat> see the femur and what the first thing what we do is we just react or we just make the bone react it with a uh, weak acids we are just uh, putting the bone inside a weak acid now what happens is this will become very soft the bone becomes very soft and you know very uh, you can actually tie a knot with that it becomes something similar to a rope now what happens there is all the minerals will be removed because the, of the reaction with the weak acid so it is important that the strength that that you know that rigidity of the bone is because of these minerals now the same bone if you actually burn it in you know in fire if you actually burn the bone what happens is all the organic components the organic matrix is going to be destroyed now what you get is only the minerals but again it will be very high it will be very you know very uh, dried up 
but what happens is it is very brittle it is easily breakable the purpose of the bone is not served there so the durability or that you know that uh, complete texture is given by this organic matrix so it is important that bone should have all these things in adequacy otherwise the functions whatever we discussed before will not be able to be achieved by the bone at any cost so these are the things which we see under the microscope periosteum the different types of cells uh, organic and inorganic ground substance so keep this in mind now what happens is these things can come in different sizes shapes different arrangements alignments and that is how you differentiate bone now, how can you differentiate bone? Types of bone can be based on maturity and on based on histology. So, based on maturity, we have the mature lamellar bone, immature woven bone. So, mature bones, which is usually seen in the adults, immature, which is usually seen in the younger uh, age groups or, you know, the children. So, mature is also called as the lamellar bone and immature is also called as the woven bone. So, there is a reason why mature is called as lamellar. We will learn about that first. Okay. That is very important because this is the whole essence of the whole session. This, If you understand this, everything uh, you know, will seem out to be very easy. Here, it is important that there are certain terms that you should understand. Okay. That terms is what I have listed loud. Uh, listed out there so what i'll tell you is see this is a sheet right this is just a sheet now what does this sheet contain you know you can see small lines present in that sheet yes and you can see small dots yes so basically this is a sheet of a it's a it's a bony plate it's a sheet of the bone substance now what is this bone substance bone substance basically has all the cells the the different types of the cells which we discussed the organic uh, matrix and the inorganic matrix. So all these things are there. The uh, collagen fibers are there. Osteocytes are there. Um, calcium is there. Phosphorus is there. All these things. So this bony plate is what we have first. So this is called as lamellus, a single bony plate or a, a, a unit of the bone structure is called by the name lamellus. Now, what you have to understand is, if a lamellus is alone, you will not get the required thickness or the strength for a bone. So, what it does is, it will just stack itself one over the other. So, you can see multiple lamellae being stacked one over the other. See, you saw that? Multiple lamellus, some four are there. Now, this arrangement of the bone is called by the name trabeculae. So, they form a trabeculae where one lamellae forms or stacks over the other. Now, that is the second word, trabeculae. Now, if you see, there are some spaces between these uh, lamellae, right? Each lamellae, there are some spaces. Now, in these spaces, you can see certain areas, they just get widened. They just become flat. See, these areas, they just become flat. And this flattened spaces, the areas, the, flat, the spaces are already present and some areas, some spaces of this will get flattened. In this flattened spaces is where you can see the osteocyte. So you can see one osteocyte in each of these spaces. And now that space is called by the name lamellae. So that space is called by the name, uh, sorry, that space is called by the name lacunae. I'm very sorry, that space is called by the name lacunae. So we started off with lamellae which is a single sheet of the bony substance, which gets stacked into multiple layers. You call it trabeculae. And there is a small space between them. And this space is some of the areas of these spaces get widened or um, becomes, um, you know, occupied by the cells of the bone, which is the osteocytes. That is called by the name lacunae. So this is called as the lacunae where osteocytes are present. I hope you understood the first three terms, lamellae, trabeculae, and lacunae. Now, osteocyte, we already know. We do not have a doubt on it. And finally, canaliculi. Now, what is this canaliculi? For that, I'll take you to this diagram. So, I told you, when I told about osteocytes, I told you they have small extensions outside. Cytoplasmic processes, we said, right? See, these are the cytoplasmic processes of osteocytes. Now, if you see, each of the osteocytes, adjacent osteocytes, they communicate to, with each other with the help of these processes. Now, they just fuse the two cytoplasmic processes of each of the adjacent cells. They just communicate together. And that is why it is called as canaliculi. So, canaliculi is basically the uh, cytoplasmic processes, the communications between the two osteocytes through the cytoplasmic processes. So, that is where the communication happens. They exchange the nutrients. They do all kind of, you know, any kind of cellular communication that happens is through these canaliculi.
Now, this all things, if a pattern follows all these things, that is usually seen in an adult bone, in a mature bone, and hence it is called as a lamellar bone. Now, if you see an immature bone in a in a in a younger in a younger age group, you call it a woven bone. None of the above or above things are seen above order is there. And it's just a very random, uh, you know, organization, random uh, fibers arranged uh, in their own manner. So that is what is seen in a woven bone. So all these arrangement is usually seen only in a lamellar bone. Okay. Now, all these things we understood. The real question is yet to come. How should we identify a slide when we're given in histology? So basically in histology of bone, you will be given two slides. One will be of the cancellous or the spongy bone and one will be of the compact bone. So we already know based on histology, these are the two divisions we have. Now, this is where we will be discussing about that. So cancellous or spongy bone, usually seen in the ends of the bone, which we already discussed. Remember, we have all this lamellae, trabeculae, all these things here also. But the arrangement is a little different. The way how they align themselves or arrange themselves are a little different. So if you see here, these are the trabeculae, right? Now, it is easy because these are the trabeculae because they have all the ground substance. They have the cells. You can see small dots. Can you see small dots? These are actually osteocytes. The nuclei of the osteocytes is what you see as small dots. Okay. Now, here, instead of forming straight, straight, straight trabeculae, what they form is they form a network. They join on all the sides. See, they're joining on adjacent sides and they form a network of trabeculae. If you see, all these are network connected to each other okay so when they form a network of trabeculae what happens is there will be a space that is formed because of the trabeculae forming a network so there will be space in the middle now what is the space in the middle the space is nothing but a bone marrow so the bone marrow will be enclosed by the trabeculae around it's it's it, sh it should be learned like that. For understanding purpose, we can say that the trabeculae forms network. There is a space in between, no, like that. But the, the real way to take it is there is bone marrow and bone marrow are separated from each other. They are forming as small clusters. The bone marrows will be formed as small clusters here by the trabeculates which are forming network. So in the trabeculae, you can see the nuclei and bone marrow is seen as small cluster spaces enclosed by trabeculae. Now, inside the bone marrow, if you can see, you can see the second image, you can see it is like very whitish, empty, empty, empty cells are there inside. See, very whitish cells without nucleus and all. See, that is why, because there are, a, there are numerous fat cells in this bone marrow. Okay, the bone marrow is rich in fat cells. Correct? And the spaces between these fat cells, the spaces between these fat cells will be formed by blood forming cells. You can see small, tiny, tiny, blue, blue color nucleus and all there, right? So that is the blood forming cells, which is present. So basically you will have fat cells as well as hematopoietic cells there in the bone marrow. So this is how a spongy bone will look. So when you are given a slide of a spongy bone or a cancellous bone, this is how it will look. And you will have to make sure that you mention these four points. These four points are very important. This is how the identification features of that particular slide is made out by any student. So a network of bony trabeculae with nuclei of osteocytes, spaces enclosed, which is the bone marrow. They have numerous fat cells. And between the fat cells, you have blood forming cells. So that is how you identify the cancellous or the spongy bone. Now coming to the compact bone. The next question is how to identify a compact bone. Now, if you see a compact bone, one more thing. See, guys, there is a small starting here. See, this is where we started. This is the starting of the, the slide. This is the periosteum, okay? So the outer layer, there is a fibrous and a cellular layer. So that is how you actually draw. But make sure these are the important findings that you take out from that particular slide. Now coming to the compact bone. So compact bone, uh, let us take this image. So this image is actually a, a different cut section. Imagine this is actually a, a, you know, it's like a cake you have cut. It's a layered cake and you have cut a, a triangular piece of that cake out of it. So in that way, you just understand it. So, so the red outer covering here is actually the periosteum. Okay. This is the periosteum and you have the endosteum here. Endosteum is here. So you can see there are the star-shaped cells here. 
these star shaped or these dots whichever you are seeing the hole is nothing but the osteocytes so osteocytes are and they are connected by small lines nothing but they are the lamellae which we were talking about we already know what a lamellae is now this lamellae arranges a diff like different patterns in the compact bone so we have three patterns here okay three different arrangements of lamellae the first arrangement is see this very near to this um, uh, periosteum you have these you know circumferential it is fo forming the complete circumference it is completely going like that so basically they are circumferential lamellae so the the first arrangement is circumferential they lie parallel to each other and they are circumferential now you can see the circumferential lamellae on be just below the periosteum and near just above the endosteum also so you have one here and one here so you have one here which is the outer circumferential lamellae and you have one inside which is the inner circumferential lamellae so that is one arrangement the lamellae is are, are getting arranged around the circumference that is circumferential lamellae one is outside near the periosteum one is inside near the endosteum so that is the first one the next one is you can see these circles see these circles there is a center yellow points there and making that as a common center there are multiple circles and this circles is where the lamellae is arranged it is that that form which the lamellae is getting arranged so there is a common center and around the common center the lamellae is getting arranged so how can we call it that is called as a concentric lamellae because there is a common center and it is getting arranged around it it's called as a concentric lamellae and now what is the common center for these uh, cells these lamellae the common center is nothing but a canal that canal is running throughout the length of the bone now what is the name of that canal the name of the canal is nothing but haversian canal name of the canal is haversian canal which is in the center and you can see concentric lamellae around the canal now this concentric lamellae with the haversian canal together okay they both together is called as the haversian system it's called as the haversian system or the osteon it's called haversian system or the osteon now that is the second arrangement so we have a circumferential arrangement we have a concentric arrangement now the third arrangement is between these haversian systems these are all single single haversian systems right see between these haversian systems can you see, see small lamellae arranged here and all so it's between them right so between them and hence it is called as interstitial lamellae so we have three first one is circumferential second one is concentric third one is interstitial lamellae and we have a canal in the center of the concentric which is called as haversian canal now if you see there are multiple haversian canal which is running throughout the length of the bone right now these haversian canals why are they there they are there because the nerves the blood vessels all these things has to be running through these canals you can see all the nerves and blood vessels running through them now if you see each of these haversian canals are connected to each other also see this is one haversian canal this is another haversian canal they are connected they are interconnected with another canal now what is that canal's name that is nothing but the wolfman's canal that is interconnecting the adjacent haversian canal so it's very simple if you see looking at the slide you can understand it just at one glance that this is compact bone this is spongy bone that's not at all difficult but understand what are the different reasons why this was compact why this was a uh, spongy so these highlighted points are the points which will fetch you complete marks to uh, put down in the histology paper why you saw this is because you'll have spotters and you will have uh, you'll be asked to put down two points why this is uh, the specimen of uh, compact mode so you can mention about how ocean canal you can mention about concentric lamellae and you can even mention about the circumferential lamellae these are the important ones which you can see so this is actually this image is actually for the understanding purpose i hope you guys understood now for the slide purpose this is how your slides will look like so this is how it is so you have the concentric uh, lamellae you have the haversian canal here this is the circumferential lamellae and in between small areas you can see the interstitial lamellae so that is how the bone will actually look like so i hope uh, you have understood about what exactly we were talking today we were doing the histology of the bone and it was very uh, 
uh, you know, easy um, if you understand the important points. It's very easy. Once you understand the anatomy of bone, the histology becomes very easy. And you have already related the clinical anatomy of all these things are already discussed by Sanjit sir in the previous session. So I would not want to repeat it again. Sai, do you want uh, me to repeat osteocytes for you? Okay. Uh, okay, okay. You have started answering. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So I'll not waste much of the time. Let's move on to the session. So uh, can we have uh, the discussion with uh, our dear students? So the first question was, uh, yeah, a mature bone cell is called osteocyte. I'm so happy Sai has answered it right. Uh, that's the correct one. Now, um, there are other options given, osteoclast, osteoblast, osteone. I hope you have got an idea about what all these things are i would not want to repeat such you know um you know major you know that's the basic things which we will have to know about now coming to the second question central and perforating canals in compact bone contains anyone who would like to answer anyone who would like to answer yeah so sai has answered option a uh yes blood vessels Central and perforating canals in the compact blood, uh, compact uh, bone contains blood vessels. It is very true. It's not neurons. It is not bone marrow and not cartilage. It is basically the blood vessels and the nerves, which is usually coming into that uh, particular, um, you know, canal. Now, the next question is uh, main structural unit of a compact bone. These are all very simple questions, but you may go wrong if you do not recall it. That's why I'm just putting it out again. So structural unit of a compact bone is my question. So again, uh, we have option A, which is osteon. Uh, so I would uh, just like to correct you, Sai, here. I have mentioned um, main structural unit of a compact bone is, yes, yes, compact bone is nothing. Yeah, you've answered option A, right? Yes, nothing but osteon. That is the right answer. Uh, so going to the next question, which is all are correct about periosteum, except you can take your time, read the question. I'm talking about periosteum. One statement in that is wrong. So outer covering of the bone has function of providing nutrition present all over the surface of the bone has inner and outer layer. Anyone else who would like to answer, who would like to give a competition to Sai? All are correct about periosteum. Okay. Sai has answered B. Satish has answered C. Okay. Uh, Sai, I would just like to correct you here. It has a function of providing nutrition. I told you there are periosteal vessels. So they will be providing nutrition, right? Yes. Yeah, you have corrected yourself. So they are not present. The periosteum is not present throughout the surface of the bone. I told you in the articular cartilage, in the articular surface, we do not have the uh, bone uh, getting covered by periosteum. So that is about the uh, next question, which is ruffled membrane or uh, is a property or is a is a you know is a peculiar feature of which of the following ruffled membrane? Okay, osteoclast. Yes, we already saw that there is an irregular extension or irregular projection in one border of the cell which is seen in the osteoclast of the uh, osteoclast. That is what a ruffled membrane is all about. And uh, coming to osteons, the sixth question is about osteons. Uh, osteons are ring-like structures. They are also called Haversian canal. They are rich in adipocytes, helps in demineralization, which is the correct statement for osteons. I told you, Haversian system is also called as osteons. So remember Haversian system. What is Haversian system? They have a canal as well as the concentric lamellae together. So are they ring-like? Do they Are they also called as Haversian canal? Are they rich in adipocytes? Are they helping in demineralization? It's a little confusing one, but I think you can give a chance, give a try and see. Anyone who would like to answer? It's okay. Even if it's wrong, it's okay. We'll try to understand what exactly is there in the question. Okay, I'll 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 take it up. Osteons are Haversian systems. Okay. 
it's the Haversian unit in total. So you can't call it as Haversian canal, right? Haversian canal is just the canal. Osteons are both Haversian canal plus the concentric lamellae. If you go back, if you go back and see, they have both, correct? See, they have the middle canal, the Haversian canal as well as the concentric lamellae together, okay? Now, they are ring-like structures. That is one answer which is correct. They are actually ring-like structures, okay? That is very correct regarding um, osteons. But are they rich in adipocytes? No. The bone marrow which is seen in the spongy bone is rich in adipocytes in the fat cells. And also, uh, they do not have any part in demineralization. It is a function of uh, our osteoclast cells. So remember, osteons are just ring-like structures. That is the only statement correct. There will be only minor differences in some of the questions. This is one of the previous year questions, actually, uh, which I got from um, RGHS. So there will be only small differences if you see, but it's very important that you catch it up right. So flattened spaces between thin plates of bone is called. Okay, there are flattened spaces between the thin plates of bone. And what is that called as? It can be lamellae, lacunae, trabeculae, canaliculae. Anyone who would like to answer? Okay. Sai has answered option B. Lacunae. Correct, Sai. So, the thin plates of bone is nothing but the lamellae. And the lamellae, when get arranged in stacks, it's called trabeculae. And between them, there are spaces. And these spaces, there will be flattened areas where osteocytes will occupy these spaces. And that's called nothing but lacunae. Very correct. And uh, coming to the eighth question, perforating fibers of Sharpe are, are they seen in periosteum, proliferated mesenchymal stem cells, also described as limiting membrane, gives epithelium-like appearance. So it's a very easy question, direct question. Anyone who would like to answer that? Perforating fibers of Sharpe it's okay even if it's not a sure thing for you. You can try answering. We'll discuss it. Okay, C. Perforating fibers of Sharpe uh, are also described as limiting membrane. Uh, um, so, Sai, we had a discussion on this. So, uh, perforating fibers of Sharpe are nothing but they are the extensions or the proliferations of the, the periosteum into the deeper layers. Okay. Limiting membrane is, and it's also termed as limiting membrane. The periosteum itself is termed as limiting membrane. Okay. But these are basically extensions of the periosteum, seen in the periosteum. So that is the right answer. So they have nothing to do with proliferated mesenchymal stem cells because that is about the progenitor cells. And limiting membrane is periosteum itself. Okay. This fibers are an addition or additional um, part of the periosteum to be uh, very precise and it doesn't have any epithelium like appearance because it's very fibrous it's very you know it looks like a fibrous band like appearance in the image okay so that is the eighth question now coming to the functions of osteoblast osteoblast blast is the one who gives birth to new bone cells so Functions of osteoblast is everything except one is wrong in this. So, which one is the wrong one? Try answering. Anyone who would like to answer? Okay. Uh, basically, osteoblast, as I told you, it is forming new bone cells, right? So, laying down of organic matrix, definitely it has to be doing that function because new bone formation, laying down of organic matrix is important. Laying down collagen fibers. Collagen fibers is also important for the ECM, extracellular matrix. So that is also important. So osteoblast, another important function is even in calcifying the matrix, in getting in the inorganic compounds, it has to make take a role because that is the role. Creating new bone, putting up new bone is its whole purpose. Now, once the bone is formed, once the complete bone is formed, to maintain the integrity, that is the lacunae is the bone, complete bone with the matrix, right? The lacunae as well as the canaliculae. To maintain it is the function of osteoclast. Osteoclast. So basically when the lacunae, canaliculae all are formed, it is like a mature bone, right? It's a complete bone. Now osteoblast doesn't have any role in that. To maintain the integrity of a mature 
is matured form, form of the bone is the purpose of osteoclast. So option D is the answer. Okay. Now coming to the last question. Uh, sorry about the spelling. The false statement is wall of marrow cavity is lined by endosteum. Marrow cavity is filled with bone marrow. Marrow is red in color at bone ends. Yellow marrow present in the shaft of adult bone has blood vessels and blood forming cells. So this is actually a recap from the previous session. So Sanjit sir had a discussion on this. Just a question to, you know, recap that. So anyone who would like to try out this answer? Okay. Uh, is it too confusing? Don't worry. Uh, just read, see, these kind of questions, what you will have to do is read the options again. Make, uh, you know, just put, uh, write it down in a in a small side, uh, you know, in a small sheet of paper, just write it down and check it. If you are finding it difficult with lengthy questions, just do that. So the wall of marrow cavity, so there is a marrow cavity and the cavity of the that, that marrow is lined by endosteum. So we saw a picture in the beginning where we saw there is a medullary cavity and that is where the, the whole covering is by endosteum. Endosteum is the marrow cavity lining and periosteum is the main bone ka covering, right? There is no doubt in that. That's correct. Now, marrow, ca marrow cavity is filled with bone marrow. Yes, that is very understood. That is what it is about. The bone marrow is occupying the whole of the marrow cavity. And we have something called as red marrow and yellow marrow. Okay, so the red marrow is usually seen at the ends of the bone, at the upper end and lower end. Hmm? And the bone ends is what we see the red marrow. And why is it red? It is red because it is having blood vessels and blood forming cells there. Correct? It is red because it is having blood vessels and blood forming cells. And in the middle, in the shaft area, we have something called as yellow marrow. And this yellow marrow is yellow because it is rich in fat. So here, if you see the last sentence, the yellow marrow present in the shaft of the adult bone has blood vessels and blood forming cells is the sentence, which is wrong. Yellow marrow, which is present in the shaft of the adult bone, should have fat, not blood vessels. So blood vessels is for the red marrow and the blood forming cells. Okay. So that is how you differentiate. So that is all um, in today's session. So I hope you have got an idea about uh, what the whole topic is. Only thing is you have to understand what this slide is all about. The main, you know, idea about the bone and this slide, the, the terms that you have to keep in mind so that you understand how the bone is arranged and stacked. And then finally, the, the two important slides which comes for histology. So once you know these four important slides, it's like everything you will score. And remember to write down these points in your, you know, spotters or in your uh, 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 histology uh, exams, exam papers. If these points are there and, and a neatly drawn diagram is there, surely you will fetch uh, up to 80 to 90 percentage of the marks of that particular question. So that's all from my side, guys. I hope you understood. And um, I am sorry that I couldn't have a very interactive session today. Um, one, because uh, I do not have anyone else to moderate the session for me. And another one is that uh, it is... Uh, it is a, you know, technically there are a lot of things which is uh, making me go forward a little difficult. So I'm sorry with that, but definitely we'll uh, cover up all these issues in the next session. I hope it was uh, informative for you. At least you understood something. If you can let me know if you have understood something from the session about the whole thing, it would be nice. Uh, was it worth listening? Did you guys get what exactly uh, the histology of bone is all about? If you can let me know, it would be well and good. Um, in the meanwhile, while you put your comments there, um, surely we'll be coming back with our next session on Friday and um, I'll get uh, Dr. Sanjit or Dr. Ryan for you guys for the next topic and we'll be discussing on um, the the histology of muscle in the next session. So any any queries or anything, please do let me know. So I hope I can wind up uh, today's session if there are no queries. So is is it can I wind up then? Thank you, Sai. It means a lot for me. Thank you so much. Just read out that important points. Uh, it will really help you understand what it is.
thank you so much so hope uh, we can uh, see you soon with the next session also until then bye from me and uh, good night thank you